All right. Um, let's see. Can somebody give me confirmation that they can see the slides that say welcome to remote prep? Yeah, you're good, Zan. Yep. Thank you. All righty. So what's the goal of this class? Uh, well, first off, I think everybody has come in with their own goals. Like maybe you want to go to an immersive. Maybe you just want to learn a little bit about coding and building stuff. Um, and this will prepare you for both of those things. Um, aside from that, we intend to teach autonomy. So this is a really important skill to have as an engineer uh, or as a developer. So let's say that you're working, you know, you're working at a job um, and you'll get some direction when you go into it. But a lot of it is you're going to have to go online and kind of read through the documentation of different libraries or look at uh, Mozilla Developers Network, which is a great source for JavaScript, or Stack Overflow, which is like a forum for answers. And you have to be solving problems on your own. And we really want to give you the confidence that no matter what the problem is, you can go find the solution for that problem on your own. Um, and on that note, we want to give you a strong JavaScript foundation. So when you encounter those problems, you might already have a solution in mind. You might be able to figure it out without looking anywhere. Um, but even if you don't have all the resources, you'll have enough of a foundation to know where to look to figure it out, to know where to begin. And then back to the point of getting into one of the immersive programs, uh, we want to make you interview ready for not only Hack Reactor remote beta, but also our other immersive programs. So Hack Reactor is part of an umbrella organization called Reactor Core. And they also, let's see, aside from Hack Reactor, they have uh, Telegraph Academy and Maker Square. Um, and I think that they have one that they just added one for, um, for iOS for mobile development. Uh, but yeah, we want to make you ready to interview for any of those schools because the, the technical interviews are very similar for all of them. Um, and then we also want to teach you collaboration and communication. This is another important skill that I think is maybe overlooked when people have an idea in their head of what a developer looks like. I think people like think of like a hacker alone in their room, just like uh, typing away and I don't know, making crazy stuff happen. Um, and it is fun to play that character, but actually a, a fairly significant part of the job when you enter a, uh, a workspace, even if you are freelancing and like, let's say that you just interact with clients and you're doing the work on your own, it's important to be able to communicate about uh, what you're doing. And especially when you're working with other developers, it's important to be able to communicate very specifically about the code that you're writing. Um, and on that note, uh, we'll be working in pairs or groups of three every day. Um, and we'll be practicing something called pair programming, where you have someone that's a driver, so that's the person that's actually typing the code, and then you'll have a navigator, so that's the person that's looking at it and saying, you know, I think this needs to happen next. They're kind of talking at a higher level, like, mm, I think maybe we could solve that by doing this, and the other person writes the code that does that. Um, and you'll want to switch back and forth on those roles uh, daily, so, you know, at the beginning of the day, somebody might start as a navigator or a driver, and then maybe half an hour in, you switch. Um, you don't have to be in a hard schedule like that, but you definitely, if you notice that you're less comfortable in one of the roles, you should try to go into that role um, more often. Um, so soft skills goals, communication and interaction. Group dynamics. Um, again, talking about pair programming, where you're working in twos. Or later in the curriculum, we'll be working on projects in bigger groups. And it's important to hear other people's ideas, to be able to communicate your ideas. Um, and to, especially when you're dividing a coding project, it's important to be able to communicate very clearly what pieces you're going to be coding on and how they're going to interact with the other pieces um, so that everything works together. Um, building community. Uh, I definitely encourage if y'all are working outside of class time to stay active on Slack. And if you have questions, you can pose them to the class in general. Um, it's a great way to 
make use of the community that, that you've joined by participating in this class. Um, expect plans to change. So on the whiteboard, we have a, a schedule of, uh, it's a tentative schedule of lectures that we'll be doing each day laid out. Um, but those lectures might change based on the needs of the class. So if we need to spend some extra time on something or if people are moving through stuff really quickly, uh, we might rearrange those a little bit. Um, if there's a specific topic that it seems like a lot of people want to cover that isn't covered, we might take uh, a day or like half a day to go into that thing. Um, so look at the, the schedule tab each day. I'll definitely update it before we start class each day, but it might change a little bit as we go through it. Uh, form over function. So the, the point of all the products at Hack Reactor and Reactor Core is first and foremost form and then function. So if you've done like Code Academy or Treehouse, they, they have some really cool apps um, and kind of a sandboxed environment that you can work inside of. Um, and we do aim to provide uh, some form, but really our primary goal is to give you the, the content to, to actually make you an engineer and not just make you someone that, you know, like when you go into the, the when you get a job, they're not gonna be giving you like, oh, here's, uh, we've already done half the code, so you solve this little piece of it. You're gonna have to know how to build from scratch. And so we're trying to give you uh, a focus on content. Um, and so here is a little bit of an analogy for that. So we've got a Ford Model T, it's affordable. It's first draft, it's a little rough around the edges. It's under design, there's not any air conditioning. Uh, and the function is, it'll get you there. If you spend a little bit more for improved form, it's expensive, um, it's an attractive design and it sells itself. The function is still, it'll get you there. On the other hand, you could spend more for improved function. This is a Parajet Skyrunner. Um, it's a car that flies. It's very expensive. Uh, it's a work in pro progress. It's got some rough edges. It's also a little bit uh, under designed. Uh, no AC, but it flies. So that's, we're trying to give you the Parajet Skyrunner. Um, we want it to function very highly and to push you past those plateaus you might hit working in more sandbox environments. All right, so this is what you can expect for enrolling in remote prep. Um, In-person support, topic lectures, cool. So that's like the bare minimum. This, is, this represents a successful program and this is what a lot of online courses are gonna look like. But we like to add some extra stuff as well. So we'll also have facilitated collaboration, and that's the pair programming and group projects we were talking about, and repo-driven curriculum. Um, repos are uh, a, a shared uh, code base, um, and they're usually shared through GitHub, and we'll teach you about GitHub, and we'll be using uh, repos during the lecture to get you used to working the way you would it out in the real world. Uh, time to code on projects and autonomy. So these are like kind of like the core offerings that we have. Um, but we like to go above and beyond that. Sometimes we'll be doing extra lectures. That's what I was talking about. There's a topic that y'all really want to cover that uh, we're not covering yet, but feels like it fits in the scope of the class. Then I can work on lectures for that and gather some materials. Um, and additionally, we'll be giving some extra lectures on developer environment. Um, and just kind of cool things that are not in the curriculum that either Jordan or I uh, feel like are helpful or necessary for your progress as a developer. Um, so we'll, during classes, when you're working on projects, we will A, be on Slack to come around and answer questions. Uh, we'll drop into your Google Hangouts. Um, and also, we'll be using a software called Flubits that allows you to code collaboratively. So we'll be able to join your Fluvits workspace and kind of code through it with you and show you 
uh, how to get past any roadblocks that you might run into. Um, and clearly specified objectives, uh, going back to the goals that we talked about at the beginning of class. Um, other perks that people may not notice, uh, emotional support. Um, so if you're ever feeling like, uh, I feel like I'm behind or I feel like maybe I'm not actually a programmer. I thought I was a programmer, but I'm really just no good at this. Do you ever have any doubts or concerns or questions like that? Definitely feel free to reach out to us on Slack or to email me. Um, and we can meet up in a hangout or a zoom and we can kind of talk about that. Um, you, everyone in the class will at some point feel what's called imposter syndrome. It's the idea that like, Oh, I'm not supposed to be here. Everybody else is actually good at this, but I'm really just kind of posing that I'm a developer. I'm not really good at this. Um, and it's definitely like a normal feeling as you're learning. Um, and you kind of have to learn how to move past it. Um, cause it's a persistent thing. No matter how much, you know, you'll always feel that a little bit and you just got to keep, uh, learning and increasing your skills and pushing through that doubt. Um, social events. So there might be some lectures through Hack Reactor um, that we will invite you to. Um, these will be after hours. Uh, they have people come in from, from all different kinds of places, uh, people that have created open source projects, uh, Hack Reactor alumni that are working in the curriculum. We're going to have the head of remote prep actually come into class one day to talk about uh, remote beta. Um, so that's out there. And then also accountability. Um, we're not going to be like grading you on the work that you're doing, but we will be keeping track of what you're, we're doing. And if, if we notice um, anywhere where we're struggling, we might reach out and be like, hey, I think it would be helpful if you tried to do this thing or um, just be like, I noticed that you're struggling with this. So what can we do to help you progress past that difficulty? Uh, strategy and a roadmap. So again, if you want to get into the immersives, um, I can meet with you and we can talk about a, a, a plan to get into the cohort that you want to get into. Um, and even if you have something else that you want to do, if you, you know, want to start a freelance web development business, I can meet with you and we can talk about what would be a good strategy and roadmap beyond, uh, remote prep to move towards that. Um, all right, so imagine that each of these classes holds value. Uh, now, for these core things that were guaranteed when you signed up, those are gonna be completely full glasses. The problem with offering all this other stuff is that some of those things can look uh, kind of like half empty glasses. Um, and I would just encourage you as we move through this to realize where things that, that we're adding, um, like with the social events, I don't completely have control over when those lectures happen, uh, those after hour talks. Um, so I can't say like every Wednesday, we're definitely gonna have a talk. Um, but I just encourage you to look at these as added value on top of the core full glasses that we're definitely offering. Um, learning is frustrating. Uh, and again, when, when you start to feel doubts or you feel like maybe you're not good at this, um, I would encourage you to reach out to us or reach out to your peers. Um, and just remember that it's a natural part of moving forward with the de development. Um, and I think more than that, I feel like the days when you're frustrated are actually the days that, uh, you learn the most, you realize uh, a day after or a week after or a month after that like hey this thing that I was so frustrated with that day is now second nature like I understand it completely but you had to hit that point of frustration to be able to uh, for that to really sink in um, and on that note try to practice positivity when you feel yourself getting frustrated uh, you know get up get a cup of tea uh, take a five-minute break and then come back to it and continue working. Um, cool, so that is the end of that lecture. Um,
before we do move on to the other one, uh, I'm going to see if there are any questions. So you can either speak up or you can message me in the Zoom chat um, with any questions that you may have had about that lecture. Yeah, just to clarify, um, in regards to the prep program preparing you for the technical interview, do you feel like after the prep program you should be able to hit the ground running and say take the technical interview on the 14th, like the day after it's over, or will there need to be supplementary studying post-prep um, to be prepared for the technical interview? I think that you will be ready uh, the day that we end remote prep, and I think maybe even before that you'll be ready for the technical interview. Uh, the curriculum has changed a little bit since I went through it. Um, the week zero, the pre-course work, used to be part of the curriculum. Um, and so we've moved that to pre-course so we can make more time for working on the skills that will uh, get you into the immersives and help you ace the interview. Um, and on top of uh, moving the pre-course, or moving week zero to pre-course, um, we've also added some extra days for certain topics that we feel like are particularly important. And you'll see that reflected in the, uh, the schedule tab of the whiteboard, um, like advanced functions. I think I've got two or three days on there. That's a really important topic. So we'll spend some time, some extra time working on that. Okay, thank you, that helps. Mm -hmm. um, Alrighty. If there are no other questions, then I'll go ahead and jump into the next one. Ooh, let's see, it's 12.30. I will try to get through this one a little bit faster so that we can get into some coding today. All right, so how to succeed. Fixed versus growth mindset. Um, what kinds of people need a growth mindset? Effective learners, effective programmers. Like I was saying, learning coding isn't always fast or easy. Uh, you have to be persistent, you have to be positive, and you have to realize that those moments of difficulty are the moments when you're really growing. Um, so how long does it take to get a solution? Imagine coding on a project for a year, and at the end, throwing it away. Um, So one good way to gauge how well you're doing is to look at stuff that you tried last week or a few weeks ago or a month ago and work back through it um, and see how comfortable you feel with it. Um, and A, if you can work through it faster, and B, if you feel like you can explain concepts in it and subtleties of it that you didn't really understand when you first started out, that's a really good way to gauge that you're, you're moving forward. But if you feel like you're getting stuck on something or after working a lot, uh, stuff is not just sinking in, don't be afraid to reach out to us and ask. Um, and we'll have projects. Um, and, we'll, and in terms of assessments, we're going to have um, a, a repo of, uh, of tests where you have to solve a problem and it like makes the test pass. Um, and those are, again, we're not grading those. Those are more to assess where your understanding of certain topics is at um, and to have a, a space to keep practicing those. Um, solo and pair programming are equally important. Um, I think sometimes when you're in the middle of pair programming, you can lose a sense of what you know and what the other person knows, especially if they're a very uh, assertive partner. Um, and I would say one uh, anti-pattern, something to watch out for when you're pair programming is what's called drivagating. And that's where, let's say that you're the driver, the other person is navigating, and you feel like you understand the material a lot better. And they, they run into a space where they don't know what to do or like they need a little bit of time to think through the solution. Um, if you're kind of jumping in and being like, oh, I know how to do this, and you're just like typing it and not explaining it to them, that would be drivigating. And it also works in the reverse. If you're, uh, if you're navigating, but you're working on a shared code base, uh, again, we're gonna be using a software called Fluebits to work collaboratively. 
and you kind of say, oh, I think this should happen, and they don't know how to code it immediately, and you jump in and start coding it for them, that would be trafficating. So it's, uh, it's important to work solo to get a sense of what you understand, but then it's also important to uh, learn how to be a good pair um, and learn how to talk about your code. Um, I think that's one opportunity that a lot of people miss first starting out is that when you're working with someone that might know a little bit less than you, um, it's actually a really great opportunity to assess your understanding of the material and how clearly you can communicate it to this person that's still learning it. Uh, so how do we keep track of your progress and make sure that uh, we know you're progressing? So first off, if you raise red flags, again, you can reach out to us and just say, hey, I'm really struggling with this. I haven't been able to get past a certain point. Um, we we will come around to flu bits. We'll look over the work. Um, and if we see a particular issue uh, that you're struggling with or it seems like maybe you don't understand, we might reach out and be like, hey, it seems like you don't have 100% understanding of this. Um, can we set up a meeting, an office hour to work through it? Or uh, here's some extra materials that might help you understand it better. Um, so myself and Jordan uh, will be looking out for you. Um, what does a successful student look like? Um, so these are some main areas that will help you reach success. Um, and I think these apply for remote prep and also for the immersives and also in your professional career. Um, these three relate to mental advantages you might already have, uh, but could cultivate further. So how valuable is it to have a particular skill compared to the potential advantages listed? Um, this is a small to medium dot. Uh, we think it can confer a moderate size benefit to you, assuming you possess 100% of this advantage. So if you fully understand that skill, it'll help you a little bit. Like if uh, a job is looking for a specific JavaScript framework and you fully understand that framework, that's helpful, but it's not necessarily everything. Um, and also not, I would say not the most important thing because often, even if you don't possess the skill the job is looking for, if you present yourself as a confident and uh, intelligent developer, they, a lot of times jobs will overlook that or rather say, we trust that they can learn that skill on the job. So how much of this potential advantage is necessary in order to succeed? What is the minimum you could possess and still be likely to reach your goals? Uh, so just a small bit of red, um, meaning you need, uh, only a bit of this asset working in your favor to succeed. All right, so what about intuitive sense of math and logic? Would having 100% of, uh, of this potential advantage be more or less valuable than having an incredible technical background? Uh, about 50%, again, um, it's great if you can walk into a coding challenge that happens in an interview, that happens in a Hack Reactor interview, and you can just immediately grasp the problem. Um, but immediately grasping the problem is, uh, and solving the problem in interviews is not, not the whole point. Uh, a big part of it is, again, being able to communicate clearly about what you're thinking and how you think your solution is going to work, and if there's uh, small flaws in the logic, that's okay. A lot of times interviewers are looking more for how you work through problems that you haven't seen before or don't understand immediately. Um, so these three over on the right relate to personality advantages you may already have or could cultivate. Uh, so motivation and passion for engineering. Um, this definitely shows through in interviews um, and I think people can see when, you have, when you're passionate about what you're doing and you're curious about the problem that's being presented. Um, and you have to remember in interviews, this is not completely true of interviewing for, for instance, Hack Reactor. But when you're interviewing for a job, this is someone that you're going to spend 40 hours a week with. Like they, if they hire you, they'll be spending more time with you than maybe they spend with their family. 
And so um, being passionate about the thing that they are also passionate about um, makes people uh, interested in you and want to pair program with you and work with you. Um, also, another important point is work ethic and effort. Um, it's hard to see. Obviously, this is a huge area of importance, and it looks like they've colored about 40% uh, of it. Um, so this is important to have, um, but again, it, you don't have to be uh, like totally confident going into an interview. Um, you can kind of, if, if you're confident enough to communicate about what you're thinking, uh, that'll get you most of the way there. All right, roadmap, accountability, and strong peers. Um, so it's definitely helpful to be around other people that are passionate and intelligent and can help you figure stuff out and want to work with you and work through their peers on solving problems. Uh, this is also a small part of it. It's nice to have that kind of mental nudge from your, your peers and your mentors, your teachers, your employers, uh, being accountable to getting stuff done. Um, this is also a nice little thing to have, to have strategy uh, and roadmap and goals. Uh, but again, it only, it will take you part of the way there. You need a, a bit of it, but it doesn't have to be 100%. Um, so what does coding professionally feel like? Lost, alone, and afraid, perhaps. Uh, completely unequipped to do what is required. Sometimes it does. Uh, going back to imposter syndrome, a lot of the time you walk into a situation like, I don't know how to solve this. I've never solved this before. Um, but that's what being a, a developer, a software engineer is, is that you are encountering problems that you've never solved before. And you have the, the confidence and autonomy and curiosity to meet that fear and then move past it to dive in and say, this is actually a really interesting problem. And I know at least a few things about this problem. And I'm going to start from there and see if I can figure it out. Um, sometimes it will feel like you're held to unreasonable expectations and deadlines, especially if you're working. Um, you know, if you're not freelancing, if you're working like, uh, if you're working at a company where you have to go have meetings, but they're still expecting you to solve this thing that again, you don't know what the solution is yet. Um, a lot of times that can be scary. Um, basically like being in the special forces, again, going back to that kind of stereotyped image of being a, of like a hacker kind of like typing away and making amazing things happen. Uh, kind of like the movie war games where like nuclear, uh, thermonuclear war is avoided by just like really quick typing. Um, yes, that's true. I have no idea what it's like being in the special forces. Um, it sounds terrifying, but it's not too terrifying. Um, Um, a glimmering punctua of pure clarity and childlike wonderment. I don't, ex I'm not totally sure what this part of the slide, uh, is getting at. I definitely do think that when you start to get into coding, sometimes you encounter, uh, like a data structure or a library or some piece of code that's just really beautifully written. Um, and just like pieces of logic that once you start to understand them, um, seem really beautiful and interesting. So that's my two cents on what that line means. Um, so going back to autonomy, um, because you're going to have to be autonomous in the professional world and it's not easy to code professionally, uh, we're going to give you a little bit of that experience where we're going to give you something that maybe you don't have all the information. We're going to give you enough information to, to know where to head to go figure it out, but we're not going to give you all of the information and then just have you kind of paired it back or like repeat coding that you've already seen. You're going to have to solve some things on your own. Um, so please decide now whether you're okay with that. 
hard does not equal bad. That's one thing about, um, I think that Code Academy and Treehouse are really good places to, to start out with certain skills. And I started at Code Academy. But the thing about those sandboxed environments is that you start to get some like muscle memory and learn how JavaScript syntax works. But then when you're given a, a blank screen in an editor, you have no idea what to do or where to start with it because you've never, um, you've never had to encounter a, a problem that you didn't already have all the information for. So uh, we're going to give you the mindset that hard is not bad. Um, coding is dominated by infuriatingly mundane challenges. So what that means is that, um, you know, a lot of the times you, you write something, you're like, this is totally going to work. I'm totally through with it. Um, and then you go to run it in your browser and you're getting some weird error. You don't know where it's coming from. You search for like three hours. You're reading about the documentation on, uh, online on Stack Overflow. And then you realize that, oh, I had a syntax error right here. Like I was missing a semicolon. Um, that is a, a problem that you're going to run into a lot, frankly, as you're starting out. And an important reason not to get frustrated with stuff, because it's when you get frustrated that you miss those small little points um, that feel like second nature. Uh, and because you don't have to think about them, a lot of the times that's the areas where mistakes happen. All right, a thought experiment. Suppose you are in the upper 1% of a class of very high functioning peers, you're offered a chance to transfer into a different class full of even more impressive peers where you will be in the bottom 1%. Is this opportunity a favorable or unfavorable one? Uh, would you feel better or worse being in that, that upper class? Um, so hopefully you'll, you would take that opportunity, even though it's scary. Because being surrounded by great peers and being in a challenging environment is what's going to push you to excel and be even better. Um, so imposter syndrome that I've talked about a little bit already. Um, first off, don't compare yourself to where other people are at. We're all at different points and we've got different races to run. Uh, and it's more helpful to look at your progress and look how far you've come. Um, let's see. I'm probably going to skip some of these because I think that this slide may have come from the immersive where sleep and exercise are very difficult to come by, but very important things to balance with coding. Um, so no grinding rule. That means like don't sit there for the entire class, not knowing what to do with this one problem. If you, if you've been trying to figure out a single thing for, um, I don't know, you can set your own range between 15 and 30 minutes, but definitely no longer than half an hour. If you hit that point, ask Jordan or I on Slack for help figuring that out. Um, on the other side of that, uh, you should spend a little bit of time trying to figure it out. Don't immediately come to something that you don't know how to do and ask us to come solve it for you. In fact, we're probably not going to come solve it for you. We're going to come, we're going to look at what needs to happen, and then we're going to give you another breadcrumb to send you in the right direction. But um, we want you to figure out things on your own. It also keeps us from burning out in class. Um, so we will keep track of your progress, uh, and you focus on the program and do your work. Um, let's see. I think. Yeah, we'll go to the end of it. Um, so, how are you going to maximize the value of prep? So, uh, let's see. These are slightly different. Um, I would suggest that you arrive at class on time every day. Um, reach out to help for us when you feel like you really don't understand something or if you feel that there's an area that you're falling behind in. Uh, and each day when you finish the day, think about 
whether you feel like you understand what you've covered in that day and if you need more work on it. And if you do need more work on it, um, time permitting, try to put in some extra work that day, that evening, or the next morning before we start class again so that you are ready to go for the next topic. A lot of these uh, lectures are going to build on top of one another. Um, they have this keep it classy, don't taught other schools or recruiters. So like don't go on Quora or Reddit and you know be like, Hack Reactor is the best. This other school sucks. Um, don't do that. All right, so that's the end of that lecture. Um, do we have any questions on that lecture before we dive into it, dive into work? Alrighty, um, so the topic today is JS and the DOM, and I have a, another lecture, a much shorter lecture on that, uh, that will lead to the work we're going to do today, but before we start working on the topic of the day, I want to get a, uh, a sense of how people, uh, where people are at with getting their developer environment set up. So you should have gotten an email from the, from our admissions team that talked about setting up Node, Git, uh, Sublime Text. Um, and you don't have to have Sublime Text. You can use whatever editor you like. Um, but I want to make sure that we're all, uh, we all have those things set up because they're going to be necessary to do the work that we do today. Uh, and the way that I'm going to do this, um, in Hack Reactor, we have uh, something called B's and P's, which is essentially a way of, in chat, showing thumbs up or thumbs down. So uh, if you open up the, the chat window, you can get to it from the bottom of the Zoom screen. Um, if you're a thumbs up, then you're going to type a, a B into chat. If you're a thumbs down, you're going to type a P into chat. Awesome, Dan. Looks like you've already got it. Cool. Yeah, if everybody just wants to throw a be in there if they understand that. If you feel like you need me to reiterate it, you can throw a P in there. Cool. All right. Looks like we are good with Bs and Ps. Um, so now let me get Bs and Ps on whether you have um, whether you have an editor, have that editor set up with a node build system. Um, and whether you have uh, Git or GitHub set up on your machine. All right, that looks like a P, missing the no build system. All right, uh, and Sam, well, we can get together and work on that. Are there any other Ps? Not sure on the text editor. Kimberly, do you have, um, have you opened uh, Sublime Text or Atom or WebStorm or uh, Notepad? Um, yeah, you will want it to work with Flubits. But I don't think I've encountered an editor that doesn't work with Flubits. Um, and don't worry about having Flubits set up yet. I haven't. Um, I'm going to give a lecture on that. I think today we're just going to work on our own machines and kind of share the screen. And then tomorrow, um, I'll I'll get everyone. I give a short lecture on Flubits and get everyone set up. Um, I don't want to kind of overload the day with lectures. Um, so that said, let me, I'm going to quickly walk through the process of getting the node build system set up. And, and then uh, I'll give the lecture on, uh, well, I guess I'll give the lecture first. And then I'll walk through getting the node build system set up quickly. And then y'all can break off into pairs and work. And for anyone that's still having trouble with their editor or getting the node build system set up, you can stick around in Zoom and we'll troubleshoot for everyone.
Um, all right. So JavaScript and the DOM. So to start, we need a way to run JavaScript. You have to, to run it in some kind of environment. That's why you set up Node in your, um, that's why you set up Node in your editor so that you have an environment to run JavaScript in. Uh, it kind of understands how to read JavaScript. Um, so if you, well, let me start on a page. Uh, first off, if you don't know this, if you go to about colon blank, you can go to just a blank page on the browser. And now I have the browser's JavaScript engine to work with, um, but I don't necessarily have any other things happening on the page that might interfere with what I'm doing. Um, and you'll notice that I have uh, an extra screen open on the bottom here. This is called the console. Uh, the way that you get to it with Chrome is by going to developer JavaScript console. Um, you can also hit, if you're on Mac, you can hit Command Option I. Um, I think if you're on Windows, it's Control Option I. Uh, and it also varies from browser to browser. So I think on Firefox, there's uh, along the, the top menu bar, there's a drop down called Tools, um, and then Web Developer Tools. And then I think that's how you get to the JavaScript console. Uh, but in any case, where, wherever it is, if you need help finding it, you can probably just go to the help and type in console. All right, so we have this blank page. Um, whatever I write right here, it's going to interpret as JavaScript. So console log is a way of telling this, the console, to, to essentially to say something. Cool, so it logged, this is the console. Um, don't worry too much about the undefined right now. We will, we'll get into why that happens later on. Cool, so they're showing you how to go to the console. Oh. The console is a JavaScript uh, REPL, or read, evaluate, print loop. It will evaluate any JavaScript that you give it, and, um, Mm, let's see, we're not gonna prove that right now. We just jumped in the console and did that. Um, but if you wanna follow along on your computer, you can open a browser window and open the console uh, and try out some of the stuff that we're doing on here. All right, so in JavaScript, there are six different data types. Um, the five primitive data types are a number, a string, a Boolean, undefined, null, and then there are objects. And you may, if you've done a little bit of work on your own, you may have heard of uh, arrays. Uh, and arrays behind the scenes are actually a kind of object. Um, so numbers, they're numbers. They work as you expect. You can do basic math with them. You can use decimals. You can use scientific notation. Uh, there are three numbers that behave a little bit differently than other numbers. Um, A, infinity. Uh, and it is written out like that. Uh, negative infinity, which is written by saying minus and then typing out infinity, and not a number. Um, and not a number will happen in a lot of strange cases, like if you try to divide zero by zero, or subtract infinity from infinity, or if you try to add a number, uh, if you try to add a string to a number, um, or um, yeah, weird cases like that where you're essentially doing stuff with numbers that it doesn't understand how to do. Strings are anything that comes between quotations. And you can use single or double quotations. Um, but you have to, whichever one you choose to open it with, that's the one you have to close it with. And if you go to a, a new line in your editor, so if you hit enter and you start a new line, um, it, you'll either, it won't recognize it as a string, or you'll have to use this character called the new line character. Um, and then it will say, okay, so the next line that's coming is still part of the string that I'm in the middle of. Booleans. 
Booleans can be one of two values. They can be true or false. Um, and it's also possible to um, take other values which are not Booleans and kind of extract a true or false value from that. Um, and we will, we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, and then undefined and null. And these represent the absence of a meaningful value. Uh, let's see. We saw in our console that when I, when I logged something, it, it did what it does. It logged it, and then it showed undefined. What happens here is uh, essentially there was no value coming back to the JavaScript environment from the console log function. Like it did a thing, and then since it didn't, uh, there was no value that came back from it, this undefined came back to, be, to show that absence of value. Uh, and then operators. So operators are things that we use to string together different values and do things with different values. You notice there's some mathematical operators. Um, there's different types of equality where you can say, does this value equal this value? There are uh, relational where that are less than, greater than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to. Um, there's a type of operator which tests if, uh, you know, you might say, is this a type of number? Is, this a, is, this, is the type of this thing a string or a Boolean? Uh, there are binary operators. Um, so this double and and then these two straight lines represent you saying in JavaScript, uh, I want this and this to be true. Or you can say, I want this or this to be true. And we'll, again, we'll get into that in the curriculum. Um, and then assignment. So you'll notice when we're testing if things are equal, we're using a, uh, either double equal or triple equal. Or in the case of saying, uh, if you see the exclamation point before the equals, it means not equal to. Um, and so you'll notice that these are never a single character. If we use a... Uh, a single equal sign, what we're saying is that this thing that was this value before is now equal to this other value. So we're exchanging where uh, a variable is pointing to. Um, let's see. So I mostly explain these. I'll share these slides uh, after the lecture. Um, so the order of operations in JavaScript is the same. Uh, as in math. Um, so for instance, the um, multiplication will happen first, but you can isolate addition or subtraction with parentheses. Uh, logging. So this is what we did in the browser window a second ago. Um, and it's useful for a whole bunch of purposes in the real world. Uh, usually you're using it to, you're not using it as part of a program for a user to see, but rather for yourself as a way to figure out what's going on inside a program. Um, so they're explaining why undefined was logged as well. All right, so now that uh, we know how it works, let's see, we can, I'll try, I'll try some experiments with it. I'm gonna hold off on that until we go over to the node build system. Um, Variables. So to catch and hold values, JavaScript, provi JavaScript provides a thing called a variable. Um, so variables are words. You may notice it, it looks kind of like a string. In this example, foo is the variable name, but there's no quotation. So if you have a string without quotations, what's happening is that you're telling the program this sequence of letters, numbers, characters, uh, I want you to store this value that's on the right-hand side. Um, or rather, I want you to point to this value. So in this example, uh, the var keyword is what you use to initialize. This whole thing is called um, a, st a statement. Um, so the var keyword tells the browser that we're declaring a new variable. Foo is the name that we've chosen for that variable. And then we're using the assignment operator to say foo equals the value we want 
our, to assign our variable to. In this case, it's the string bar. And then we finish any statement with a semicolon. Um, let's see, let's test some variables. In the console, declare a variable named remote prep and store a value in it using your imagination. So you can do this in your machine. I'm going to go do it in the console. All right, uh, let's see. So I'm going to call it remote prep. And we'll set it equal to the string. This is remote prep. All right, so now whenever we uh, talk about that variable, when we use that variable, it's going to be pointing to this string in memory. This string is now stored somewhere by the computer in memory. So when I type remote prep, it says, oh, that points to this value, and it's going to show me that value. Um, we can also reassign remote prep. We can say, now I want remote prep to equal the number five. Um, and you'll notice that it immediately prints five. Uh, that's a little bit of a peculi peculiarity that happens with the, the browser environment. Um, and actually, let's see. I might show you what my node build system looks like now. Cool. All right. Um, so we'll set it equal to a string, and then we will console log it. I'm working in Sublime Text here, and you'll notice that I have started a, a console down in the bottom of my editor. Because I have a node build system, I can run JavaScript and evaluate a program uh, the same way that I would in the browser. So console log remote prep. Cool. It logged out that string. Um, and then what happens when we reassign it to five, but we keep console log after it. Now it just logs out five because we've changed where that variable remote prep is pointing. All right, so the DOM. Uh, the DOM stands for the document object model. This is the browser's in-memory representation of a web page. Um, and it has a tree structure. Uh, if you got to the pre-course work or if you've worked with HTML, before, um, you'll notice that each of these little boxes represents an HTML tag or some text that happens to be inside of that HTML tag. So your JavaScript program that's running in the browser has a JavaScript object um, that, that is represented as a tree structure, and it's essentially a model of what's being seen on the page, and it can access any of the HTML tags on the page. Um, and we can use the DOM to change what's showing up on the page using JavaScript. Cool. Um, so the first, uh, the first way that we'll talk about doing this is using document.createElement uh, to create a DOM element. It works similar to console log, except now it's going to show up in our HTML page. Um, so we, we use this, and then whatever we want to create, we pass into the parentheses at the end of it. And I'm actually going to do that right now. So whenever you say document, you're pointing at the top level of the whole HTML document. Uh, Cool, so now, you know, let me expand it. Well, let me expand it. All right, let's see if I can find it. Oh, I didn't add it to the page. That's what's happening. Uh, well, we'll keep moving. In any case, this now, uh, this HTML tag it exists, uh, but we haven't added it to the DOM yet.
All right, so now that we know how to create a DOM element, um, we can store this DOM element in a variable. And then once we've stored it, we will give it some text. Um, so let's see, we'll store our div in a variable. My div. And then we'll use my uh, we'll use dot inner text to give some, to put some text between the div tags. Um, and now since we've stored it in a variable, we can use that variable to invoke. Uh, this is called method invocation. So um, we let's see. We have access to these DOM methods now that we've stored it as a DOM element. Um, oh, maybe we don't. Hmm. I'll keep moving. I'll come back to that in a second. So we still don't see the DOM element because we haven't attached it to that DOM tree. Um, we can append it by saying document.body. So this will be pointing at the body tag of our HTML document, dot append child. Um, I'm going to log out my div to see if it's existing. All right. Um, Let's reassign my div, and I'll just put the text in there when I create it. Mm. Let's see. Actually, well, I'll just depend it. I'm not sure why inner text wasn't working. Now you'll notice the first time I had to stringify the div um, because there wasn't one existing in the program. And HTML is stored in your JavaScript program as strings, but now that I have it stored as a variable, I can just use that variable. Oh. Had a typo. Failed to append child on node. New child element contains the parent. Oh, I wonder, it might be because we're on a blank page. Let me try this on a different page. Cool. Um, so now we have appended that child to the page. Uh, there's a whole lot of other things on this page, but this final div at the very end of the body tag, that's what we just added to the page. Um, so you can create HTML, you can add HTML using uh, JavaScript. You can also uh, change the CSS and HTML using JavaScript. Um, so for instance, uh, again, if you got into the pre-course and you have worked with CSS some, uh, you can change class. So like, let's say when we want a user to, uh, when a user clicks a certain box, we want to add a border to that box. Um, we, if we've got a predefined CSS style that has a border, we can add that class to uh, the element. Um, there's a little bit more, uh, there's, the curriculum covers specific methods um, that I'll let you figure out on your own, but the most important part is to understand that this 
document object model that exists in your JavaScript program is a representation of what's on the page, and you can use JavaScript to access parts of that tree and manipulate them. Um, cool. So actually, I'm going to start sharing it again so I can show you the build system. Um, All right, so in order to install the build system, um, you're gonna go to tools, build system, new build system, and then I've got links that I will copy and paste into Slack. Uh, this one has a, a build system, the snippet that you'll have to add for Mac, and then I'll also add a snippet uh, for Windows. So in this build system, I'll copy and paste that snippet. And then I'm gonna save it. Uh -huh. Maybe Sublime Text is freezing up. All right, well, I will come back to saving it in a second. Um, okay, there we go. All right. So you'll want to save it as dot sublime build, and you want to save this one as node. Node dot sublime build. Uh, and I'm going to replace my old build. Cool. And now, uh, when you click uh, on Mac, it'll be Command B, or on Windows, it'll be Control B. Um, it will evaluate in the bottom of a uh, little console will pop up, and it'll evaluate down here. Um, all right. So. Now I'm going to have us break off into pairs and we'll go to the curriculum app and we'll be working on week one, day one. Um, and let's see, there's a little bit of talk of the command line. Uh, you don't have to worry about that at the moment. Um, we are, um, we're gonna scroll down to the exercises uh, and you'll start working on exercises together. Um, starting tomorrow, we'll use Flubit so that we can work collaboratively on a single code. Um, I think what I'll have us do today is each person will be working on their own machine um, and you can, use, um, you can use the node build system, you can also use the console um, you'll need a, for some of the exercises, you'll need a, an HTML document to work with. Um, so let's see, I, if you haven't gotten to the pre-course, so you don't know how to create an HTML document, stick around, uh, and I'll also give you kind of a quick rundown about how to do that. Um, and Oh, and one last note, the, the, uh, the DOM methods, the, anything that you use to manipulate the DOM, it won't work inside of your editor uh, because since you're not in a browser and showing something visually, there's actually no, um, there's no DOM to work with as such in this environment. All right, um, so I think, let's see. We have set up pairs on the whiteboard uh, I'm sorry to do this, Jordan, but I think I might have to, uh, I might have them go off on their, uh, and set up pairs on their own, because I want to have people that uh, have made it through pre-course and people that haven't made it through pre-course um, pair together. So I'll make two sections. 
Uh, one, one, if you've done the pre-course or, and or you know how to use HTML and CSS, and then I'll make the second section below if you haven't gotten to the pre-course and you don't know how to use HTML and CSS. Um, so go ahead to, let's see, using the whiteboard and using Slack, uh, find someone to pair with. We might need um, pairs of three uh, if we have an uneven number. It should be even, Sam. Well, I think the, it, I think it depends on who. Oh, yeah. Um, how many people have completed pre-course or know how to use HTML, and how many people don't? Um, so it might be a little bit different, but yeah, just try to shoot for pairs. If you're unpaired, uh, then and there's nobody else to pair with that is at the same place as you, uh, then ask another group that already exists if you can join them. Um, so I think people that uh, that feel comfortable with the pre-course and are ready to start working on the exercises in the curriculum app. Um, anyone in that camp, do you have any questions before I let you go? Oh, I think someone told me that. A question. Yeah. Uh, what was the, uh, the thing to do uh, the node set up in Sublime? You said you were going to copy some sort of text. Yeah, I'm gonna, so when you go to tools, build system, new build system, it automatically opens up like a, a template file for you. Um, I'm going to copy and paste the uh, code snippets that you'll need to put into that file um, to make the node build system work. I'll put those in Slack in just a second. Is that the same for Atom? Oh, thank you. I totally forgot to talk about Adam. Um, Adam is actually a little Thanks. bit e easier. Um, Adam has packages uh, that you don't have to do anything. You just use pa uh, the package manager. So on Adam, you hit, I think, command, comma, and it'll show you the settings. And then you go to install packages. Um, and I, I'm trying to, I think they recommend uh, a package called JavaScript eval. Hold on one second. I'm going to open up my Atom to see what I use. Yeah, it's called um, eval dash JavaScript. So I just typed that in the chat. And I also, I use uh, a package called script. Either of those are good. There's probably other alternatives. Uh, let's see. So Tasha asked, week one, day one, or week zero, day one. This will be week one, day one, JavaScript and the DOM. Um, and then I think I'm going to uh, grab another shareable link for the whiteboard that I will, I'm pasting that into Slack. Um, so that, that link should be, uh, you should be able to edit the whiteboard if you go to that link, but let me know if you have trouble. I know that some people, uh, weren't able to edit the whiteboard before. Um, cool. So for anybody that, uh, is about to go off and pair up and work on exercises, um, do y'all have any other questions before I let you go? Cool. All righty. So uh, whenever you're ready, you can sign off of Zoom, uh, coordinate in Slack, and find a partner. Um, and then with them, create a, a Google Hangouts. Don't worry about the flu bits today. Um, and paste that in the whiteboard so that we uh, can come by and see how you're doing and answer any questions. Um, Cool. And on that note, I will go ahead and uh, start helping people if they're having trouble with the node build system. 
Uh, so are there any questions about setting up a node build system? Uh, yeah. So according to what you've sent us before, I downloaded the Node.js system, but I'm not able to, I don't quite understand how you necessarily link it to Sublime or use it with, use the node system with Sublime. Okay. Um, let's see. Have you, so did you, did you go to tools and build system in Sublime? I did not. Okay. Uh, so you'll go to, uh, in Sublime text to go to tools and then go to the build system drop down and then click new build system. Okay. Um, and then in that you'll copy and paste over the contents, like get rid of what's in there already. Mm -hmm. And then you'll copy and paste, uh, one of the two snippets that I just put into Slack, uh, depending on if you're in Mac or windows. Um, and if it messes up the spacing, uh, you might have to redo the spacing, but speak it, it, it is sensitive to how things are spaced out. Oh, okay. All right. And then you would, uh, save it. Uh, yes. And then save it as uh, node sublime build. Okay. Um, and now if you create a JavaScript file, so you'll have to create a file and save it as, uh, like test.js. Or if you already have a JavaScript file, um, you can use that. Okay. So I'll just create a JavaScript file. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and how do you, how do you create the JavaScript? Uh, so if you, you'll create, uh, let me share my screen so I can, um, show you how to do that. You're asking how to create a JavaScript file. Yeah, like I, I just did the the save as node.sublime build, but the next so, is. if you go over, there's two ways of doing it. You can save, you can go to like file, new file. Um, a shorter way of doing it is that if you right click um, on a folder, you can go down and click new file. And then you'll see a little bar open at the bottom. So I'll save this. Uh, I'll save this as test.js. You want to make sure that you have the JS suffix. And now this is a JavaScript file, and so I can evaluate any JavaScript in it. Uh, let's see, I'll create a variable. Well, let's log it out. Console log two plus two. And now if you hit um, either command B or if you're on Windows, control B it will run in the bottom of your editor. All right, um, let's see. Are there any are there any other questions? Uh, getting a no build system message. Uh, Patrick, would you mind? Can you share your screen? <laughs> 